This lecture is part of an online course on Lie groups and will be about the modular function of a Lie group. Um, I should just start by explaining that the modular function of a Lie group has very little to do with the modular functions that you get in the theory of modular forms. They're, they're, they're just completely different objects. So in last lecture we saw a left invariant measure on a Lie group need not be the same as a right invariant measure. And we saw an example of this in the AX plus B group um, consisting of all matrices of the form A, B, 0, 1 with A greater than 0. Um, and what we're going to do this lecture is, is study this phenomenon of when left invariant measures are not the same as right invariant measures. Um, so Suppose we've got a group G, which I'll just sort of draw as a big blob, um, and it's got an identity element E, and you get a left invariant measure as follows. We pick V in the nth exterior power of the tangent space at the identity of, of G, so, so L is just the Lie algebra. So here's L, it's a sort of tangent space here, and we're picking some V um, in the exterior power. Well, we don't really quite want V in the exterior power. As you remember from last lecture, there's a sort of sign problem going on connected with the orientation of G, but we will just ignore that and work with the exterior power for simplicity, and remember this, this isn't really quite correct. And then if we've got any other elements of G, we can translate V to um, an, an element of the exterior algebra of the tangent space at some other point g. So, so we have lambda to the n, the, the nth exterior power for tangent space at g, by left translation. In, in, in other words, we use the translation x goes to g of x. And that will give us an n form on the group G, which will give us a left invariant measure. Alternatively, we can map V to the, ten, to the nth exterior power of the tangent space at G by right translation. We take x to x times G. So this gives us two maps from the exterior power of the tangent space of the identity to the exterior power of the tangent space at G. And the question is, are these the same? Um, if they're the same, then left invariant measures are the same as right invariant measures. But as we saw, there are cases when they're not the same. Um, so um, what we get is, is we're first um, translating the, the nth exterior power at the origin by left translation of G and then uh, comparing it with doing it by right translation of G. Well, we may as well first do left translation then do the, 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 then bring it back using right translation. We're getting the sort of conjugation action of G on the nth exterior power of the tangent space. What this is really coming from is that, is that G acts on G, the, the group G, by G by x goes to g, x, g to the minus 1. And this maps the tangent space at the identity to the tangent space at the identity, and therefore it also acts on the nth exterior power. Um, so um, what this um, gives is essentially a homomorphism from g um, to the positive reals, because um, this is a one-dimensional vector space, and we're acting by, with, by G on this one-dimensional space, so we get um, a homomorphism G to the, to the positive or negative reals, and as we're really working with measures rather than exterior algebras, the, the action, the, the image has to be positive. Um, so we've got this map from G um, to a positive real, which Gives, takes it to the absolute value of the determinant of um, the, the, the adjoint action of G on, L, on, on the 
tangent space L at the identity. And um, uh, this is more or less the, the modular function, or at least it's one over delta of G, where delta is so-called modular function. So the modular function is a one-dimensional representation of G. In other words, delta of G H is delta of G times delta of H. And it maps G to the positive reals. And delta is identically one if and only if right invariant measures are the same as left invariant measures. So um, um, what we're going to do now is to look at a few examples. First of all, there are loads of examples when the modular function is equal to 1. Well, this happens for abelian groups. Um, that's obvious because for abelian groups, um, right invariant measures are the same as left invariant measures. Similarly, it happens for discrete groups, again, because measures are just the counting measures. It also acts for simple or perfect groups. Um, we'll see why in a moment. And for compact groups. And the reason is that these groups, simple groups or compact groups, have no um, homomorphisms to the positive reals other than the trivial one. Um, so for simple or perfect groups that follows because the positive reals are abelian and for compact groups the image has to be compact and there's only the only compact subgroup of the positive reals is, is, is the identity element. Um, slightly more tricky to show this is also true for nilpotent groups. Um, you can check that the joint action of the nilpotent group acts by uh, preserves the pre preserves the exterior the, the highest exterior algebra of the Lie algebra. Um, so um, we can also have examples where the modular function is not equal to one, and obviously this is going to happen for the um, ax plus b group of two by two matrices like this. And let's actually work out the modular function explicitly. Well, we need to work out the adjoint action of this on the Lie algebra. And we can um, think of the Lie algebra as being all matrices of the form x, y with x and y real. So this is really the Lie algebra. So that's why we have a zero down here rather than a one. And then we need to multiply by the inverse on the right, and the inverse of this is a to the minus one, zero, one, and we get um, minus b a to the minus one, and this is equal to x minus b x plus a y, zero, zero. And now let's think what this does to volumes. Well, the x coordinate is mapped to itself, and here the y coordinate is multiplied by a, and then we have this um, minus b x, which um, it's a sort of skew transformation, makes no difference to the volume. So, so this multiplies volumes by um, the absolute value of A, being careful to get the sign right. So um, delta is of A, B, 0, 1 is just the inverse of this, which is 1 over the absolute value of A. Um, by the way, just to show why we need to put in an absolute value sign, um, let's just look at the example when the, the group G is just the reals um, with, with a semi-direct product of the group generated by 1 and minus 1. So we can think of this as being translations of the real line, and this is being multiplication by minus 1 of the real line. So this is just the isometries of the metric space consisting of R. And here the Lie algebra is just R, so the highest exterior power of the Lie algebra is again just R. And now you notice that um, the, the, the group 1 minus 1 acts as minus 1 on 
the nth exterior power of L, but as one on measures. So um, when we're calculating the modular function, um, you, 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 you don't look at, you don't quite look at the action of the group on the nth exterior power by conjugation. You actually have to take the absolute value of this action, which gives you one. Um, we can also convert left invariant measures um, d mu to right invariant measures just by using the delta function. Um, the right invariant function will be delta times d mu. Um, Actually, uh, there's a sort of 50-50 chance you should actually put in a 1 over delta there because one of the big problems in the theory is it's very hard to remember when you should use delta and when you should use its inverse. Um, I, th I think it's delta, but it's quite possibly wrong. Um, so um, now let's look at some applications of delta. So one of the main applications is the following problem. Suppose we're given H contained in G with H closed. Then we can um, think of G act, acting on G over H. So this is a transitive action of the group G on some space. And we can ask, can, can we put an invariant measure on g over h. This would obviously be very useful. We often want to integrate over spaces and if the space is acted on by a group we would like to integrate over the space on a way that's invariant under the group. Um, so let's start by looking at a couple of examples. So example one, let's take g to be SL2 of r um, acting on the upper half plane consisting of numbers tau equals x plus i y with y greater than zero. And it acts on this by a, b, c, d, tau is equal to a tau plus b over c tau plus d. So this is the action you get in the theory of, of modular functions. And let's write it as a quotient group. We take h to be the subgroup fixing i. So h is just equal to the things of the form cos theta sine theta minus sine theta cosine theta. So this is just isomorphic to the circle group S1. Um, and um, if you've done hyperbolic geometry you might recognize this as being the upper half plane model of the um, hyperbolic plane and SL2 um, acts on the hyperbolic plane and it has an invariant measure which is given by um, dx dy over y squared as you can check if you want. Um, then we have example two. So example two we're going to take the group G to be SL2 of R. And we're going to let G act on tau by A, B, C, D tau equals A tau plus B over C tau plus D. And you're probably by now thinking I've got confused because this is the same as example one, but it's not quite because we're going to take tau to be in the real numbers union infinity. So this is now the projective line. And now we notice there's no invariant measure because um, the, the, the um, automorphism a a to the minus one um, multiplies volumes near naught by a squared. And if we've got an element of the group that locally multiplies volumes by some constant, there can't be an invariant measure. Um, we can write G 
We can write this space as a quotient of G by group H. In fact, we see that H is equal to the set of matrices um, A, A to the minus 1, um, um, uh, B, 0. Um, so what is the difference between these two examples? Here we've got two quotients of the group SL2 of R by closed subgroups, and one of them has an invariant measure, and the other one doesn't. Um, so, um, um, well, more generally, instead of having invariant measures, we can have relatively invariant measures. So, so we have the AX plus B group acts on the reals by taking x to ax plus b, of course, here. Or we can represent this as matrices a, b, 0, 1. And now we can ask, um, oh, does r have an invariant measure? And the answer is no. And this is because a, 1, 0, 0 multiplies volumes or multiplies volumes by, by a factor of a. However, we have a relatively invariant measure. If we take the usual Lebesgue measure, so let's put du equals Lebesgue measure, then we see that the measure of g times mu, or g times u, is equal to the absolute value of a times the measure of u. So this is almost invariant. In fact, if we have a formula like this, it's, 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 it's in practice pretty much as good as being an invariant measure. So, so this is a sort of relatively invariant measure. Um, um, more generally, we could say the measure of left translation, the measure of the image of an open set U is equal to chi of G times the image of U, where this is some character of G. That means a homomorphism from G to the positive real, such that chi of G H is chi of G times chi of H. So although there's no invariant measure, there's a relatively invariant measure in this case. So now we have the following question. When does G over H have a relative invariant measure for some character chi, g goes to the positive reals. Um, and the answer is, if um, we take chi times the modular function of g and restrict to h, if this is equal to the modular function of h, then there is a relative invariant measure. So, so, so the modular function will tell you when the when, when um, homogeneous spaces for Lie groups have um, nice measures. And I'll sketch the proof of this um, as a sort of picture. Suppose we sort of draw G as a big blob, and we have a subgroup H here, and here is the identity element. And then we have some cosets of H. So these are all cosets. And we have the quotient of G by H, which is a sort of the collection of all cosets. And we want to put some sort of measure on the cosets. And what we need to know is um, what is the tangent space of this quotient space at, um, at the identity element. And the tangent space is going to be sort of the um, the tangent space of G that, 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 that's orthogonal to elements of H in some sense. Well, we can't really talk about orthogonal because we don't yet have a, um, a Riemannian metric on this, but never mind. Um, so, um, strictly speaking, it's, it's not going to be the orthogonal complement. Instead, what you do is you take the Lie algebra of G and you quotient it out by the Lie algebra of H. And you sort of draw a picture of it being orthogonal in order to imagine what it's like. So we can think of this as the tangent space of G over H at H, which is a point of G over H, of course. 
And then we need to work out what the volume of this is going to be. Well, the volumes are going to be given more or less by the nth exterior power of Lg over L of h. So if we choose an element v of this space, it will more or less give us a sort of volume element at, at the point h of g over h. As, as usual, we're ignoring the sign problem for when things aren't oriented. Um, and now what we can do is we can left translate it to all points of G. So we might sort of translate it to some point here just by multiplying it by G. And this will give us a sort of volume form at this point G of G over H. And we want it to be um, relative for the character of chi. So we should really then um, um, translate it to um, a point G by, uh, I'm going to indicate the translation of this vector V to a point G just by writing G times V. And then we should multiply it by chi of G to the minus one in order that when we translate it by G, it's um, chi of G times the, the measure at that point. So, um, um, so, so this is how we define a volume form at each point of G. But the problem is we want this to be right invariant under h, so that it induces a suitable volume form on g over h. I mean, you see at the moment we've just defined a volume form, a, a sort of volume form on, the, or, 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 on, on this pink line at each point of g, but we don't want it for each point of g, we want it for the points of g over h, and for that we have to check that it doesn't change if we, if, 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 if we, if we move it by um, to some other point of h, for example. So let's see what this means. Well, it means that um, chi of h to the minus 1 times h of v should be equal to v um, under right translation of h. Um, and now you remember v is in the space lambda to the n of Lg over Lh. And what we're saying is that chi h to the minus 1 times h v h to the minus 1 should be equal to v. So how does h act on v? Um, well, since v is in this space here, um, h acts on v by delta g um, of h to the minus 1 times delta h of h. So um, delta h is giving the action of h on this bit here, roughly speaking, and delta g on this bit here. So we can think of this as being lambda to the n lg, tensor with lambda to the n lh dual. So um, we can, so, so, so the action of h on v is given by this formula here. So we get, um, chi h to the minus 1 times delta g h to the minus 1 times delta h of h should be equal to 1 for all h in h. And this is another way of saying that if you take delta g times chi and restrict it to h, this is equal to delta of h, which is the condition we had. So this is the condition for the existence of a relative measure on um, um, a quotient space of G. Um, and now let's go back to some of the examples and look at them. Um, um, so let's, let, let's go back to the example with SL2 of R acting on the upper half plane or on R union infinity. And let's see why we can find an invariant measure on one of these but not on the other. So here we take G to be the group SL2 of R and H to be the group, well there are two possibilities. We can either take H to be the um, cos theta sine theta minus sine theta cosine theta group in the first case or the group 
a a to the minus 1 b 0 in the other case. And now we need to work out what the modular function is. Well, delta g is equal to 1, and chi must also be equal to 1 because the group g is simple. And now we need to know what delta of h is. Well, delta h is 1 here because h is compact. But here we saw this is more or less the same as the ax plus b group, apart from the fact that we've got an extra factor of a here. So here delta h is not equal to 1. And so the condition delta g times chi is equal to h, sorry, delta h, is possible in this case, but not possible in this case. And that's why the upper half plane has an invariant measure, but um, the projective line doesn't have any sensible sort of measure at all. That's a, even not, not even relatively invariant under G. Um, so another example. Here we're looking at G over H. Suppose delta H equals 1. We sometimes call groups like this unimodular, um, which is again slightly confusing terminology. Then G over H has a relative measure. And that's because we can just take chi equals 1 over delta g, so that chi times delta g is uh, restricted to h is equal to delta h, which is equal to 1. Um, if h is compact, we can do even better. Um, then um, um, chi delta g equals delta h is always true. And the reason for this is that chi restricted to h, um, delta g restricted to h, and delta h are all equal to 1 because a compact group has no homomorphisms to, homomorphisms to the positive reals. So when the fixed point of the when the fixed subgroup of the group action is compact, then you can, there's always an invariant measure. In fact, you can make a measure relative to any character of G. Um, by the way, if H is compact, you can not only find an invariant measure, you can even find an invariant Riemannian metric by choosing any metric on the um, tangent space of G at the origin and making it invariant under H by conjugation and then using that to find an invariant metric on the quotient. Um, so I'll just finish by looking at the AX plus B group acting on R. So in this case, um, H is the set of um, elements taking x to ax, so, so h is just the um, non-zero reals or the positive reals. And we see saw earlier that delta g is equal to 1 over um, a, delta h is equal to 1 because h is abelian, and the um, left half measure was, sorry, um, so, um, so we're taking chi to be the absolute value of a, and we see that chi times the modular function of g restricted to h is indeed equal to the modular function of h. Okay, that'll be all about invariant measures on groups for the moment.